Okay. So I'm not a particularly brave man. Self-awareness is a really good thing, right? I know this about myself because I've spent most of my adult life and all of my childhood trying to avoid uh, physical confrontations. And I can't imagine a career as a firefighter that folks Kendra spoke of. There was a song that was written by uh, the old folk singer Tom Paxton. It was called The Bravest. And it was written from the perspective of a survivor of the September 11th uh, attacks on the World Trade Center and how he's dealing with survivor's guilt. And the chorus goes, Now every time I try to sleep, I'm haunted by the sound of firemen pounding up the stairs while we were running down. Now I I think the reason that that song is so haunting to me and, and to others is because I just can't imagine what it is in firefighters and policemen and other first responders that gives them that mindset to run into danger when every human instinct we have tells us to go the other way. Now, I also imagine that this kind of bravery is acknowledged and celebrated because it is the exception, because it's so rare. And so what that tells me is that all of you probably feel the way I do. You know, all that heroic, life-saving stuff, That's for other people, not necessarily me. I'm forgetting to do this, sorry. Um, So other people are lifesavers, but not me, right? Not necessarily. I'm here to tell you my story, how this admitted big sissy has twice been given the chance to try and save somebody's life. And I'm here to try and convince you that you could do the same as well. So I come from a large family. I'm one of six boys. My parents were both from large families as well. I have 16 first cousins on my dad's side, 19 first cousins on my mom's side. One day when I was in my early 20s, I took note of the fact that we really hadn't had any major tragedy in our life yet. None of my cousins or my brothers had ever experienced any major tragedy. This was before I understood the concept of tempting fate. But it just seemed remarkable to me that none of us had had a serious car accident or any illness. But then, then in the summer of 1987, it happened. My younger brother, Sean, was diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leukemia. He was 20 years old at the time. Sean battled his disease ferociously. Um, This is Sean in May of 1987 at my brother Tom's wedding. And shortly after that, he was diagnosed. And he spent that whole summer taking chemo and steroids and doing everything that the doctors asked him to do to uh, try and beat the cancer. This is Sean in October of that year at at my wedding. And you can see the treatments were taxing and very difficult for him. But Sean never complained, and he was willing to do whatever it took to try and beat this. And he was in remission for a while that, that winter. But by the following summer in 1988, his leukemia had returned. Now, I'm sure most of you can relate that one of the most frustrating parts of watching someone you love battle an illness, any illness, is that helpless feeling that you have. You would give anything to be able to take away their pain and to help them feel better. But in most cases, unless you're a doctor, and and in many cases not even then, are you able to ease their suffering? But then we were told by the doctors that they were recommending a bone marrow transplant for Sean, and the most likely candidate was a sibling. Now, this was great news. Finally, at last, the chance to do something to try and help. So they did a simple blood test on my brothers, Glenn, Keith, Kevin, and Tom, and I, and uh, this was to determine which of us would be the best match for Sean. Now, I remember telling my brothers that the doctors were probably going to pick me because they were all so old that they were worried that their bodies wouldn't be able to handle the, uh, the procedure. Of course, it's retrospect, it's silly to think that I was calling them old. Glenn was 33 at the time, but when you're 25, 33 seems really old. So it wasn't just because I was the youngest, but I was asked if I would be willing to donate bone marrow to try and help save my brother's life. Now, I imagine for most of us, probably all of us, that seems like a silly question, right? Of course you'd be willing to do that. I mean, would they even be able to finish the question? Would you be willing to donate bone marrow? Yes. Right? I mean, this is your brother. This is your sister. Whatever you could do to help, you would do it for someone you love. It's probably the reason that so many people are moved by the story that travels around the internet. 
you've probably received this email. It's under the heading of a beautiful story or the meaning of love. The story goes there was a little girl who was suffering from a rare and serious disease. The story is always better when the disease is rare, right? So her only chance of recovery was a blood transfusion from her younger brother. It seems he had suffered from the same disease and recovered, and now he carried the antibodies to help cure this illness. So the doctors explained the situation to the little boy and asked if he'd be willing to give his blood to save his sister's life. The boy only hesitated for a moment and took a deep breath and said, yes, I'll do it if it will help my sister. So as the transfusion progressed, the little boy laid on his bed and smiled as the color returned to his sister's cheeks. But then the boy became very serious and started to get pale himself, and he looked up to the doctor and said, will I start to die right away? Being young, he didn't understand. He thought that he had to give his sister all of his blood. So, the story isn't true. I looked it up on Snopes, so it's just one of those things that somebody came up with to try and make us all feel better. And I think it does because we all relate to that. We all believe that we would do anything. We would love to think that we would be as selfless and as thoughtful as the little boy was in that story. So, let me assure you that the medical professionals that you would deal with are much clearer than the ones in that story. Um, They tell you everything you need to know about a bone marrow transplant. So here's what they told me about my situation uh, with my bone marrow to my brother, Sean. The process for a bone marrow transplant begins for the recipient when they're given a large and and very lethal dose of chemotherapy. Um, This basically kills their own bone marrow. And and when they start that process, it's really the point of no return. If they've started that chemotherapy and the patient doesn't have a bone marrow transplant, they're going to die. So I don't think they were worried about me changing my mind about donating, but they wanted to make sure that I was available at the time the harvest was needed. So they asked me to do something that I was very glad to do at the time, and now in, uh, in hindsight I've become even more grateful for. I got to spend the week before my bone marrow harvest in the hospital with Sean. They wanted to make sure I was safe. I guess they had talked to my family about how clumsy I was. They wanted to make sure I was going to be there. And they wanted to make sure I was ready when it was time for the procedure. And that week I spent with Sean was just a wonderful blessing. I mean, it wasn't any great you know, moment. We'd always been close. We'd always talked. It wasn't some big breakthrough. But it was just great to have that time, just the two of us there, to, to talk and visit. So then came the day, November 6th. 1998. Next week, it'll be exactly 25 years. So a bone marrow harvest is almost always performed under general anesthesia. Mine was, and so I'm going to tell you what I'm told happened because I was asleep and don't remember it. So a donor lays on their stomach, they're unconscious, and the surgeons make six small incisions right here uh, above your pelvic bones. Then they insert a special hollow needle into your, uh, into your skin and use a special syringe to draw out the marrow from your pelvic bones. I'm told it also often takes six incisions to get out the proper amount of marrow, which is generally about a quart. Now, I'm so proficient that it only took five. I think that also means that I'm a really fast bleeder, so that's another reason it's good that I avoid physical confrontation whenever possible. So after the bone marrow harvest, um, you come out of anesthesia and... Current uh, statistics show that for about 63% of donors, you go home that same day. You're a bit stiff and sore um, for a day or two, like you had a strain in your lower back. But for the vast majority of donors, that's the extent of the discomfort. Now, my wife tells me that my memory isn't as strong as hers with this, and, and it was a little bit more for me, but I don't remember it that way. I remember it being something pretty easy to go through. So, Sean received my marrow that day. One of the things that's interesting about a bone marrow transplant, unlike many other transplants, is the the donor goes through the procedure that I just told you, but unlike so many other transplants for the recipient, it's very easy. They just get it like a blood transfusion. Unfortunately, the bone marrow transplant didn't have a chance to work for Sean. The chemotherapy that they gave him uh, attacked his liver, The doctors weren't able to uh, fix that, and despite the fact that Sean fought as hard as he had for the entire 18 months of his illness, my brother Sean died on December 21st, 1988, at the age of 22. 
Now, I vaguely remember at some point during this process, they asked me if I would be interested in having my information forwarded to the National Bone Marrow Donor Registry. I said, sure. I didn't know exactly what that meant, but it sounded like a good thing. And I didn't really think about it for a long time. It was during the summer of 1999 that I was contacted by the registry and told that I was a possible match for somebody who was in need of a bone marrow transplant. And would I be willing to? Yes. I didn't hesitate for a moment. I wanted so much to have another chance to do this. So when they are donating to a non-related donor, you don't know much about the person that's receiving your bone marrow. What I was told that she was a woman in her 50s who was battling, excuse me, I do need to read this, Wald, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia is a very rare blood cancer. See, I told you, the story's always better when it's rare, right? But in this case, it's true. There are only about 1,500 cases diagnosed in the U.S. each year. What this disease does is it causes an overproduction of white blood cells, which actually makes the blood too thick to travel through the veins efficiently. So someone with this, this disease can get uh, blood transfusions regularly, but eventually that stops working for them. And in this woman's case, she needed a, a bone marrow transplant. So we went through the pre-testing, making sure that everything was right. And then on September 2nd, 1999, I donated bone marrow again. And just as I recall from 11 years previously, I didn't have any problem with the procedure or uh, a quick recovery. So after a year, the folks at the registry asked the donor and the recipient if they're interested in getting to know each other. I was certainly very anxious to, and I was happy to find out that the recipient was as well. So, one Sunday afternoon, I got a call, and we spent an hour getting to know each other. Jane Garrett is from Walterboro, ten, uh, Walterboro South Carolina. First irony, that's not too far from Gaffney, South Carolina. She's a midwife, and there's another irony. I told you I was one of six boys. Jane is the mother of six girls. However, she didn't do it the way most women have their children. She had her daughter, Wendy. Then she had triplets, Amy, Beth, and Dawn. Then she had a set of twins, Hannah and Holly. At one point, she had six children under the age of four. <laughs> it's a miracle she survived into her 50s to need this transplant, I tell you. So a few months later, the National Registry and the Cleveland Red Cross were having an event to recognize blood and bone marrow donors, and they arranged for Jane to come up, and we met for the first time. And then a few years later, we met at her home when my family and I went down to visit her and her family. So here's another interesting thing to know about bone marrow transplants. Blood type is not one of the things that determines a match. You don't have to have the same blood type to be a bone marrow donor match. And Jane and I weren't. But after a bone marrow transplant, your blood type changes. So Jane used to be A positive. Now she and I are both O positive on what that means. So here's a few other things that have bounded us together. Jane now has 10 grandchildren. She's a midwife. She's birthed them all. Her 10 grandchildren are B, Lucy, Charlie, Ben, Adara, Grace, Holly Jane, Nathan, Bella, and Kate. Now this is Jane's son, Nathan Michael. His, her daughter, her mother, I'm sorry, Nathan's mother chose his middle name after me. I was just amazingly humbled when I heard that. So I didn't come to tell you all this to brag. I mean, let's be honest. If that were my intent, I would have left out all the sissy stuff, right? I'm here to ask all of you to join the Bone Marrow Donor Registry. Anyone between the ages of 18 and 44, all you have to do is look up a Bone Marrow Donor Registry drive. You go to the website, bethematch.org. And what you do is you go there, they take a simple swab from inside your mouth, fill out some paperwork. They might need a blood uh, sample, depending on which kind of drive it is. Now, if you're 45 to 60 and you're still interested in being on the registry, you're welcome to do that, but doctors have seen that the most successful transplants come from younger people, so they almost always look for the younger folks. If you're between 45 and 60 and like to join, they ask you to make a, a contribution of $100. You start at the website, 
fill out the paperwork there, make the payment, then you go to a drive and you uh, get on the registry that way. So, if you go to that website, you can find where local drives are happening. Put in your zip code and they'll tell you where there are in the area. It's, it's an easy process. And then every day, you're there. You have the chance to be the match for thousands of patients with blood cancers like leukemia, lymphoma, sickle cell, and other life-threatening diseases. You could be the one to save somebody's life. And just as mo the most likely matches come from siblings, non-related matches are most likely to come from inside your ethnic group. And sadly, many minorities, including African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians, are terribly underrepresented on the registry. So I hope you'll join me in letting other folks know that you know that might be willing to do that to help make it possible for folks of those ethnic backgrounds to have a better chance to find a match on the registry. Oops. So, I know we've all been faced with that situation. Someone you love, someone you know is sick. We all say the same thing. If there's anything I can do to help, just let me know. And we mean it. We really do. But most of the time, we don't have the chance to do something for them. Through the bone marrow donor registry, maybe you can. Visit bethematch.org and become somebody's miracle. Thank you.